Well, Dr. Anderson asked me to speak on uh, camelid parasitology to start off the day and do some herd health topics. And my experience with visiting with you all in the past is that parasitology is really the part of herd health that you want me to talk to you about the most. So we're not even going to talk about vaccines today. We can talk about that anytime. Um, and so if you are interested in me giving you the silver bullet cure for all your parasite problems, you can step right on out the back door. I don't want to waste your time if that was what you were here for. <laughs> um, so there is no silver bullet for your parasite problems, but we're going to talk today about um, what your approach ought to be and kind of what I think your mentality ought to be towards that. And so we know what the enemies are, um, long, big long list. Um, the one that probably I get the, the single most, well two that I get the most questions about are uh, people seeing nematodirus eggs and then of course Imeria, um, the large Imeria, what we call EMAC, um, seems to be the one that people are the most concerned about. Interestingly enough, though, some of these really kind of we sort of ignore, but I find are problems. Um, one issue is, is that I've been seeing some pure trichurus whipworm infections in animals that are routinely receiving ivermectin as their only dewormer, and it doesn't have good activity against trichurus. And so then I see these animals who are thin, and I look, and they have pure whipworm infections. And so some interesting um, things that we've seen there with some of the patterns of particular parasites that animals are showing up with. What you've got to remember, and you notice that I'm not starting off this talk by talking about dewormers, and that is because the management is going to be far more important. There are not more potent dewormers coming, and so waiting for the next big dewormer to come out and solve the problem is not the mentality that we need to have. And so we're going to talk about pasture factors, stocking densities of less than six to eight animals per acre. Um, one of the biggest problems that I see is overstocked um, pastures. Remembering what kind of grass you have, and you've got to apply this to the geographical area that you're in. Bermuda, brome, and other improved pastures, while they provide better nutrition, they do somewhat help the parasites out. They form this dense canopy, particularly Bermuda. If you're down in Oklahoma, you're well familiar with what uh, Bermuda does, it forms this dense kind of cross-linked canopy, and so when the manure drops down underneath that canopy, it's protected from the sun, and it doesn't get hot in there. They have some friends of mine that have done some goat parasite research, which is where we see lots and lots and lots of parasite problems, have been able to get measure temperatures, and I'm not sure who goes out and measures the temperature in a fecal pellet, but they get these sucker, these graduate students into doing this, and they measure temperatures of 155 degrees Fahrenheit in a fecal pellet that is exposed to the sun. And so that will kill off any infective larvae that may be hatching out and hanging out in there. And so when you've got those dense, improved pastures, you may have more problem with getting the sun to do you some favors and, and uh, get, that, uh, get those uh, larvae killed off. Sparse brush allows for heat and drying of fecal pellets, but it doesn't provide good nutrition. So we need to find that happy medium in there. Um, another thing is, is that changes um, in your pasture environment, you know, if you have a wet, uh, a wet uh, time come along, will be reflected in your worm burdens in three to eight weeks. And so if you are doing routine fecal checks, which is what I recommend, and you suddenly see this big spike in your fecal egg count, Think back to what happened over the last three, six, eight weeks on that pasture because that is probably when that rise occurred and it's showing up now in the egg counts a month to two months later. And so from year to year, if you can figure out on your farm where those patterns are, then in your long-term plan, you can come up with some plans of how are we going to manage that. We know we're going to have a wet patch during this time of the year. How can we control for the worms during that time. This year has been an unbelievable year. We have had far more rain than we've ever seen. We've seen um, so many health problems related to the increased amount of rain this year. It sure made for nice looking grass and it made for great nutrition, but it has certainly made some other hurdles for us. Think about animal factors. Young animals are going to be more susceptible to parasites. Just like anything else, if you haven't been exposed to things before, you're not going to have um, as good immunity against it. Genetics probably does play a role in this, probably more than most of us appreciate, and they've really um, started looking at this in sheep and goats. 20% um, of animals in the herd 
harbor about 80% of the parasites. And so if you can find out who those animals are, and usually they're the ones that keep showing up with those high counts. And certainly when you're in a production animal type situation, like often is the case with the goats and the sheep, they've gone to culling those animals. If you are the, one of the 20% who keep showing up with these high egg counts, then you get to leave because you are contributing to everybody else's problem. Now obviously that's not gonna be necessarily conducive in the alpaca world, but if we can at least identify who those individuals are, maybe manage them separately, manage them differently, we can keep them from being the source of the problem for everybody else. New purchases, animals that get trailered in for breeding, animals who have just had crea, those are gonna be animals that have had some stress that are gonna be more susceptible at that time. Um, periparturient rise again, right around that time where you're having your crea and you're starting to lactate, that's when those um, counts are really gonna rise in those girls. Drug factors, it's important to remember that a lot of the drugs that we use are related. And so just because you go to a different um, brand name doesn't mean you're going to a different class of dewormers. So for instance, Dectamax is a cousin of Ivamec. And so people think, oh, I've used Ivamec, I'll go to Dectamax and that's a different drug. It's really, it is a different drug, but it's still related. And so when we think about resistance and switching deworming classes and those kinds of things, we really need to make sure that we understand what drugs are related so that we know that we're switching families all together. So that's a very important place for you to really work with your veterinarian. Your veterinarian knows who's related to who and really work with them about, am I truly using a, a new novel dewormer or am I just staying with the same related dewormers? No new drugs are being made, as I said. There's really no such, I have a lot of people call me and say, what would be a better dewormer? And there's really not a better one. They just have different activities, and so we need to strategically use the most appropriate dewormer for what we're actually fighting at the time. There are also no broad spectrum dewormers. They do kill a number of different worms, but they don't necessarily cover all of them. I'll bet if I had asked most of you, does Ivamec kill everything, most, most people would say, yeah, it kills almost everything. But we just talked about the Tricurus example with the whipworm, where it doesn't really get everything. And so we can't necessarily just assume that we're gonna kill all worms. They're not all the same. No drug has ever been or ever will achieve 100% kill. And that is a very, very important concept to come to terms with. And one of the most interesting stories about that is the day that ivermectin was invented and, w and came out as the original brain, brand name Ivamec, there was a cattle worm at the time that already had resistance to it. And it hadn't even been invented yet. The day the dewormer came out, and so these parasites have inherent resistance already in them. We speed that up by overusing dewormers, but it's already there. And so to expect that I'm gonna deworm and that 100% are gonna be killed off is, is an unreasonable expectation. As I said, drug resistance is a random event. One of the biggest issues we see here is the monthly meningeal worm prevention. If you are in an area where meningeal worm is a huge problem, then it's a good idea to prevent meningeal worm. What I often see, though, is people taking advice they hear from other parts of the country and applying it in other parts of the country. So for instance, if you are east of the Mississippi, your meningeal worm risk on most farms is significant. But if you are in most places that, most farms that I've visited in Kansas, your meningeal worm risk is pretty low. Because most farms in Kansas, the alpacas are out in the wide open, they're not in heavily treed areas, and so the deer don't, are not gonna come out in the open. Deer like to hide out under the trees, and so if your alpacas aren't under the trees with them, then their risk is relatively low. And so for many people here in Kansas, Nebraska especially, I recommend not doing meningeal worm prevention, doing sort of the non-drug management ways of preventing meningeal worm because we're seeing a rapid increase in GI nematode resistance because of the overuse of dewormers to try to keep meningeal worm at bay. So you've got to work with your veterinarian to determine, am I really at risk for meningeal worm? Should I really be actively doing at least the drug portion of meningeal worm prevention. Deworm frequently, should we use more dewormers? Absolutely not. Surely I've gotten that point across by now. I'm not a big fan of just routinely on a schedule going out and deworming everybody. 
and I'm also not a big fan of if this if if we use the dose that we recommend, should I just use more? We, that doesn't typically help things out either. So things that you can do to monitor um, whether whether or not you need to deworm in the first place: composite sampling of fresh dung. What I recommend is taking 10% um, of each animal group or 10 animals, whichever is greater. And so what I mean by each animal group is if you have juvenile males in this pen and you have pregnant females in this pen and you have um, your breeding males in this pen, we need 10% out of each of those pens because what is necessarily true in this pen may not be true over here in this pen. So you've got to check each group. You can't just take a sample from the females and apply that to what might be happening to juvenile males or what might be having, happening to breeding males. Um, then, of course, if we have individual sick animals come in or animals that you are body condition scoring them monthly and you find out that, gosh, this guy is losing a little bit of condition, then we may just test that individual animal in addition to our herd screening to see how things are going to see if parasites might be contributing to that animal's poor body condition score. Really feel strongly that we need a quantitative and a qualitative fecal. We need to know the number of eggs in there, not just whether or not they're present. Because a lot of this has to do with worm burden. You're going to hear me say multiple times, we are not going to go for no worms. We are going to go for a manageable number of parasites. We want a few parasites out there to kind of keep the genetics mixed up so that they'll have some, some um, susceptibility to our dewormers. And so, we don't want to just keep doing fecals and keep deworming with our goal of being no worms. We just want a manageable number of parasites. Direct smears can be done. Nitrate flotation media is probably the, is kind of what we call the, what I call the general fecal flotation that most practices do kind of just as a screening. The modified McMasters, um, and I've talked about this in presentations in the past, um, it's not sensitive down to a low enough egg per gram count to really be useful. Um, for things like Trichurus, the whipworm, and Nematodirus, those are low egg shedders, and so they don't kick out a lot of eggs, and so that technique may not be sensitive enough to pick up if they're just shedding a few eggs. The modified stoles is a little more sensitive. Um, it'll pick up down to a lower egg per gram count. Um, there was a, a paper uh, that Dr. Sebra put out last year um, where he did comparisons of the modified McMaster's direct smear uh, within the modified McMasters, he looked at sucrose or saline as the flotation media, um, and then centrifugation, uh, sucrose flotation procedure. One of the interesting things they did as part of that was they did an overnight soak. They didn't just do kind of the rapid um, procedure. They actually allowed that to sit. And then after it had set, then they uh, did their counts at 10, to, 10 and 60 minutes, and then up here for the McMasters, 10 and, or 15 and 60 minutes, excuse me. For the centrifugation flotation, they found more of all parasites except for the small coccidia, so the non-EMAC coccidia. Um, small coccidia required that flotation for 60 minutes. They couldn't find it at that 10-minute one. Um, the modified McMaster's method, letting it sit longer really didn't show to be any use um, or didn't, didn't yield more parasites. The sucrose solution found more Trichurus, EMAC, and Strongyles, and the saline found more Nematodira small coccidia. So the point of all of this is to say that we probably need to use multiple methods to really feel like we've well screened a herd. And our diagnostic lab currently runs what, the, what we have named the camelid fecal combo, which is that they run, when I send them alpaca or llama feces, they know that I want all the tests done on it so that we get a good broad idea um, of what's in there, and they are really good at finding, and it's really funny, I'll get those reports back with every different technique listed, and there will be a different combination of parasites that they found in each of those techniques. So no longer can we kind of do the one fecal and say, here's what we've got and go from there. So this is probably the best diagnostic strategy we have, which is called the fecal egg count reduction test. What it does is it tells us the number of parasites that are there, and then if we complete the process, it tells us whether or not our drugs are actually working. So what we do is we do our 10 or 10% 10 today. And then, based on those results, if we decide that it's time to deworm, we treat. Then about 14 days after, the, after we treat them, 
we go back in and redo our fecal flotation on the 10 or 10 percent again and see if we got a 90 percent reduction in our fecal egg count. If we did, notice I didn't ask for 100, we're asking for 90 percent. If we get a 90 percent reduction in that, then we can say that dewormer or coccidia medication is effect, has been effective. And so it tells us, are we giving enough? Are we getting all of it in the animal? Are the animals responding? Are the parasites responding? So that's probably the best, um, the best means of screening that we currently have right now, what I really recommend. Another one that's out there is a larval development assay. If you think about, I don't know how many of you are familiar, to, familiar with bacterial cultures, but if you have an infection, they'll take a swab sample from you and they'll swab it out on a plate and they'll grow whatever bacteria it is and then they will put these discs on there that have different antibiotics in them and then they see which antibiotic kills the bacteria that they grew and then that's how the physician decides to put you on whatever antibiotic. They can do that now with worms. So you send them a fecal sample, they do this at the University of Georgia, you send them the fecal sample, they grow up your little wormies from your alpacas manure, llamas manure, and then they test those against all the available dewormers, and they send you this report back that says ivermectin will work, or finbendazole, panicure will work, or whatever um, they come up with for you. Um, and so that is a, an interesting option. It has not been widely used in llamas and alpacas yet. Um, they did a study, University of Georgia and Fort Valley State, which I assume is a, probably a, a small university down there in Georgia as well. They looked at 26 camelid farms with, that had nematode infections, so just regular GI worms and coccidia. Um, interestingly, down there they found homonchus was the biggest concern. If any of you have sheep and goats, you're familiar with homonchus as being a big problem. Um, they performed the larval development assay as well as the fecal egg count reduction test, so the one I talked about on the last slide. Interestingly, they found multiple drug resistance was common, so they really well documented that they had multiple animals, multiple farms with multiple drug resistance, so significant concern. Of course, remember that this is in Georgia. This is like the worm capital of the world, so you, you can't necessarily use data from Georgia to panic that you're never going to get under control of your parasites because they are, if there was ever a place on earth for worms to go and live, Georgia is the place to go. They used the larval development assay, used the fecal egg count reduction test. The larval development assay predicted that blank dewormer would work. But when they did it with the fecal egg count reduction test on that same farm, it showed that they didn't get that 90% reduction like we're going for. So there is some, there may be some poor continuity there. What they think as a result of the study was that they may be, we may be inappropriately dosing animals. We may not be getting all of our dewormer into the animal. We may be underdosing based on weight. We may have an issue in this particular species where we have to give them even more than we currently think that we do um, based on their body mass. So there may be a number of factors um, that are playing in this. Another thing, again, if you're a sheep and goat owner, you may have heard about the FAMACHA method, which is where you, again, get away from routine deworming. You go around and you look at their eyelid, the inner eyelid color, and determine how anemic they are. This only works if homonchus, the stomach worm, is your problem because it is the only one that causes anemia. The other ones just take protein and nutrition, that kind of thing. So again, back down in the southeast, um, they found that homonchus is a big concern with llamas and alpacas in the southeast. And so you take this little color card out and you score their eyelids and you only deworm the animals who are significantly anemic. That's the idea behind this. So this is back to that 20% who carry 80% of the worms. We are only going to identify who is significantly anemic. I would not, I am not at all at a point where I would recommend using this anywhere other than the southeast. Number one, I'm not convinced that homonchus contortus is our biggest issue in camelids around here. I don't know if you all would agree or disagree with that. Um, the other, th and, and the, what I'm basing that on is that we don't see anemia as a significant component in our heavily parasitized animals, and that would be there if homonchus was really the problem. 
And so you'll, you'll probably start to hear some things about FAMACHA, but I'm not at all ready to start recommending, at least in this region, using FAMACHA as a, as a tool. I think we need to stick with the fecal egg count reduction test based on this study and the one before with the larval development assay. Treatment failure does not equal resistance. So a lot of people are really prepared to, if I go through and deworm and it doesn't work, then I must have resistance on my farm. I, you know, I must have a, this, the plight of not having, where dewormers don't work on my place. Not necessarily true, and in my opinion, it happens a lot less than we really, than I think it really gets blamed for a lot of things that, that aren't there. Insufficient dosage administered is probably a major one. We do need to be weighing animals. We need to be dosing them appropriately based on their actual weight, not based on guesstimates, because it's very easy to be very inaccurate. Um, remember that most of, some of our oral dewormers are suspensions, and so if you let them sit, all this good stuff falls to the bottom. Make sure you're shaking those well. If it's not shaken up every single time, different animals may get a different quantity of the actual drug itself. Are they spitting them out? If you get done deworming and everybody's face is white and the front of your shirt is white, the worms aren't on the front of your shirt. And so getting the dewormer there, it's got to go in the beast. Um, inaccurate weighing, I talked about that. And then what is the correct dose? And like I said, we may be in a position here where we've come up with some recommended doses, but are they really the best based on research? We probably don't have enough research to really say that, um, but we're, we've, we're doing the best we can. Insufficient drug activity. Look at your dates on your dewormers. Are they out of date? Have they been sitting out in the hot barn over the summer? Have they been exposed to sunlight? All of those things may be inactivating your bottle. I mean, we all do the same thing. We go out and buy the biggest, giantest bottle because it's cheaper by the CC, right? And, but if it's been sitting around for three or four years, it might not work as well as it did back when we originally got it. And I'm the cheapest one amongst us, so I'd, I feel your plight there. Um, Reinfection, I think this is a major factor for why we, why we re-see worms and animals that have been dewormed. If we put them back out on a very dirty pasture that has lots and lots of worms on it, they're just gonna pick them right back up again. Fecal flotation inaccuracy, I'm not a big fan of living by the one plus, two plus, three plus. I like to do the quantitative fecals. I want a number, not, remember that the one plus, two plus, three plus is a subjective, opinion of how many eggs they saw. It's not an actual number. Incorrect parasite spectrum activity, this is back to that not every dewormer works against every single worm. Treatment strategies, the goal is not no worms, but a manageable number of worms. I am a big house cleaner. I love to have a clean house. And so in my battle against dirt, I bought this really fancy vacuum cleaner. And it has a water tank in the bottom of it. And so when you suck all your little dirt up out of your house, it goes into this water tank. And it's supposed to hold it there. You know, it doesn't do the blow it around business like all the other ones do. So I buy this really fancy vacuum cleaner. And guess what happens? I vacuum this week. What do you think the water looks like when I vacuum next week? It looks like I have never cleaned my house in, the whole, in, in my life. The water tank is dirty every week. Even though I am using what is supposedly the best vacuum cleaner in the world. So, and I have good management. I brush the cat, I take my shoes off in the garage, I do all those kinds of things right, but every week my house is dirty. This is just like controlling worms. My goal can never be no dirt. My house is always gonna have dirt in it and I need to get over, I need to go to mental health counseling and <laughs> get over that. This is the same thing with parasites. You can deworm every week and you're gonna ruin your carpet. You know, I mean, if I vacuum every week, my carpet's gonna get broken down by the stinking vacuum cleaner. So we cannot just be deworming to get no worms. We can take our shoes off at the door, we can clean up the dung piles, we can brush out the cat, we can do no stock, you know, low stocking density, we can do all those kinds of things, but at the end of the day, your water's still gonna have a little bit of dirt in it next time you check. So, there you go. Here's why. If you have this bunch of worms and you deworm, 
the guys in the blue are going to be susceptible to your dewormer. There's always going to be a couple of them that aren't. And then they're going to breed and make a lot more of themselves. And the way the pink guys evaded your dewormer was because they had some ability, some inherent ability to get away from your dewormer. So what you don't want to do is, is keep killing off the blue guys and leaving the pink guys to keep breeding because now you're breeding that resistance into your worm population. So you want to leave some blue guys out there to get a little hybrid vigor in your... So we have kind of an alpaca breeding program, but then we also have a worm breed. You know, we want to keep some of those worms out there so they're kind of diluting the genes so we don't end up with a bunch of worms um, that are all resistant to our parasites. So the role of nutrition. I'm a big believer when I see parasite problems on farms, a lot of times I find that there, that there may be some nutrition issues as well. There's been some interesting things done, um, and, and all of this is essentially outside of the camelid literature. So I'm kind, I am taking some literary um, freedom here to present this, but, but I think it's important to think about this. Immunity is closely related to protein nutrition. We know that in everybody. Um, so if we're not getting enough protein into these animals, we're going to have issues. Phosphorus has been shown to inhibit worm establishment. Cobalt, we're looking at all of our trace and our macro minerals here. Cobalt is related to reduced immunity to GI nematodes. Adequate copper required for the development of immunity against GI nematodes. So I think this is why when you, if you come and talk to me about nutrition, we're going to talk about making sure you're getting enough dry matter intake, making sure you're getting enough protein for their uh, production class if they're gestating or if they're lactating or if they're growing. But then I'm going to tell you, make sure you have a trace mineral out there available and make sure that they have access to all those kinds of things. Because if it's not there, these are all factors that have got to play into um, whether or not we get good immunity um, against the worms. So a few words um, quickly about EMAC, the dreaded enemy that we all hate so much. Um, in 2007, um, Dr. Sebra again had done um, a retrospective study where he looked at kind of all the cases of EMAC that came into their teaching hospital. Um, 15 of the 30 animals in the paper died or were euthanized, so again, we all appreciate um, how, se how severe this is. They did, as a result of that paper, said the severity of the disease was related to the infective dose of oocysts. So however many EMAC they took in to get infected in the first place predicted how severely ill they became and what their outcome was. And so you guys, again, are probably familiar with this. They defecate out the oocysts. They get picked up by somebody else, and you just keep kind of going through this cycle through the animals and through the contaminated ground. Um, the infective stage of this parasite is on the pasture, and so this is why I really talk a lot about stocking density um, and letting pasture sit and rest and let them be exposed to the sun. Here's the really scary thing that came out in the Journal of Parasitology last year. They took EMAC oocysts, the little infective guys, and they stored them for 41 to 84 months, which I think is like six and a half-ish years if I'm doing them math correctly in my head. Um, so at the end of that time, they were able to infect every llama they put them in. After sitting for six and a half or seven years, they were able to infect animals, 100% of the animals they infected. Pre-patent period was 36 to 41 days. It's a long pre-patent period. So the time from the time that they're infected until they start actually shedding, we're out in the, the stool where we can see it. One of the really interesting things that I took away from this was three llamas and one alpaca were fed a thousand oocysts that had been stored for three months. The llamas, the pre-patent period was 33 to 34 days, which is about what we've been telling people. In the alpaca, admittedly it was just the one, the pre-patent period was almost two months. So this animal was infected with EMAC for two months before we could tell it on the diagnostic test. And this is really where EMAC gets away with murder, is that it evades our diagnostics for a, for a long time. And it looks, and again, with these low numbers, it's hard to say this, but if this really showed up to be true, that's amazing difference between llamas and alpacas. So we can't necessarily even apply what we know to one to the other, maybe, based on these low numbers. 
Really recommend doing high specific gravity solutions. These are really heavy. They want to fall to the bottom. They looked at blood ELISA testing, which basically tests, do they have antibodies to them? Have they been exposed to EMAC? And they found a very high positive rate. So what, we, what they concluded from that is, is there are a lot of animals out there that have come in contact with EMAC and have built up at least some low level of immunity to it. Looked at fecal PCR testing, which is a molecular. It's looking for the DNA. Um, and they could find it during that pre-patent phase. So they could find that the DNA was there before we could see O cysts in there. So that may be a test um, with some promise there. Impression smears of the intestine, that is going to be from taking intestine either at surgery or at necropsy after death. Um, and actually, the very first case of EMAC I ever had in my life, we diagnosed on histopath. It was an animal that was thin, thin, thin. We could never get it diagnosed. We take it to surgery, do an intestinal biopsy, and they find the EMAC in the wall of the intestine. And so that's going to be a significant part of both the diagnosis and the treatment of this parasite is that it is embedded, it gets embedded in the wall of the intestine. And so it may be that sending oral medication through the inside of the intestine may not do much for that stage that's embedded in the wall and kind of hiding from the um, antiparasitics. So supportive care is usually really indicated in these. In, um, a lot of these guys are sick enough they need to be hospitalized. We see um, significant malnutrition in them. Um, fatty liver syndrome kicks in. Lots of issues come in um, with these um, severe EMAC cases. Sulfonamide antibiotics. Um, that falls into the category. Albon would be the drug that you would be most familiar with there, is an anti-coccidia drug. Amprolium, which is Corid, um, and then the triazine trione. So that falls into like the marquee type drugs. And so um, again, all of these are currently oral medications, but there is some concern out there that we may not be able to well control this parasite with oral medications because of the invasion of the intestinal wall. I usually try to always start with either um, a sulfa or amprolium, the corid first, to see if I can get EMAC under control with that. Only in really severe cases then do I go to the marquee um, or that class of drugs. And the reason for that is, again, we go back to, I don't necessarily want to come in with my big gun right away because then I want to be able to have a reserve back in the back that will still work, kind of like our... Um, dewormers and antibiotics and those kinds of things. So um, there's some philosophical things there that we could debate all day, but um, those are the three kind of classes of drugs that get used the most. So your take-home messages for today. Perform routine fecal egg counts at a laboratory that does lots of camelid fecals. I can't tell you how many inaccurate results or how much difference we see between different people doing fecals. And so I really strongly recommend submitting these fecals to your local lab that has lots of experience with camelid fecals. I actually don't even do them myself. I have our lab people do them, and that's because they know how to do it exactly right to find what I need to find. Target deworm, only animals that need it and only when they need it. We don't need to be doing this just kind of routine deworming. And then watch your management, stocking density, new additions. One of the scariest things that I keep seeing happening is people will say, I took in this female for breeding. I body condition scored her. She's kind of low. I'm going to send you a fecal to see what you think. We get it here. Our lab looks at it, and they've got EMAC, and they've just brought EMAC onto their place. And so I'm a big proponent of checking those animals before they ever show up on your place. There's no better way to give yourself an EMAC problem than, having, than either purchasing it or having an animal come and bring it in. So be really, really careful about that.